Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, good? Okay, awesome. Uh, it's always a little bit awkward when um, you hear your bio be read, especially when marketing wrote it for you. So it was like a little cringy. I'm like, oh my gosh, I promise I don't tell people I've won so many awards. Definitely don't. Um, okay, well, I wanna make sure I keep an eye on the, the clock. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, as you, you know, heard from my bio, I didn't go to BYU, but uh, I hold a very dear spot in my heart for BYU because uh, when I did move here from Bolivia, people ask me all the time, like, how did you guys find Utah? Like, because when people ask me where I'm from, I say, oh, Bolivia, like, it's so exotic. And then um, they're like, but, but I grew up in Provo. It's not as exciting. Um, but my dad actually, just a quick side story, my dad found missionaries in the middle of nowhere, Bolivia, LDS missionaries, and he got converted um, when he was 15, 16, went on a mission shortly after, uh, was taught about this magical land where dreams come true called Provo, Utah, and he needed to go to BYU. <laughs> and so we were these immigrants living in the middle of nowhere, Bolivia, um, with this dream to come to BYU, uh, which is kind of cool. So my parents came at a really young age with me as a four-year-old and my little brother as a five-year-old uh, to BYU. And so, and they actually just live down the street from here. So um, I, when I was thinking about like what could I talk to you guys about, I think probably the most like beneficial thing, at least for me as an entrepreneur, is hearing other people's stories. Um, so I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna tell a collection of stories and I'm gonna weave a few lessons here and there. And so hopefully this is fun for you and hopefully you walk away with some nuggets of information. But before we jump in, I kind of want to get a read of the room. Um, who here, I'm guessing everyone wants to start their own thing, like who here wants to start their own thing someday? Yeah, most of us, okay, cool. Um, just don't be shy, just spit out like what industries or like what you want to do. Don't be shy. Any software plays out there? E-commerce? Software investing, okay, so venture, some venture people in here as well. Okay, a little shy. I'm also like low-key mortified. I might have seen like one of you guys on Mutual or something. So like if you did, just like <laughs> pretend, pretend I wasn't here. Um, so, hey, now you guys are where we got. Um, okay, I'm gonna use a Z clicker. Um, so the reason I uh, intentionally did uh, lessons I'm learning is because, again, I'm very much like you guys. I, probably a little older, but um, I'm still very early in my entrepreneurial journey. I've had an awesome career, which we'll talk about here in a second, which I'm really grateful for, um, but I'm still really early in my career, and there's so much more uh, that I want to do, and so this is what I've learned so far, and maybe if I get invited back, if I haven't, you know, gotten banned for life, but if I get invited back in five years, I'm curious what this presentation would look like then, right? Uh, so, quick intro to me, which I already did. Um, formally, I go by Andrea. You guys can call me Dre. That's what my friends call me, um, or Drea or Andy. Uh, my Instagram name is Andy, so sometimes people like come up to me like, hi, Andy, and I don't know what they're talking about. So, feel free, whatever comes to mind. So, quick high level. This is, these are like the most important things to me. Um, I'm going to try the laser. Let's try the laser. Uh oh Okay, so I am an aunt of this beautiful little baby girl, my dog, my family. Um, that was kind of cool. Uh, my friends, love my friends, spend a lot of time with them. My team is amazing. Uh, and then the nonprofit that I started, just quick six pictures highlighting who I am in a nutshell. All right, so I love this story. And like I know when I, when I talk, I don't have an accent and I don't really seem like a typical like immigrant because like maybe how I dress and like maybe how like, I don't know how basic I look right here. Um, but, uh, but it's a pretty cool like immigrant story actually. Um, I wanted to, I put this picture on because I highlighted, or my mom found this in our like little, uh, her pile of memories or something. But going back to like when we were in Bolivia, even though I wasn't like old enough to actually contribute anything to us coming here, um, I do have early memories of what it took to get us here. Uh, and frankly, that's all my parents, right? And we would do things uh, <laughs> like, uh, for example, there was a university in Bolivia, and my parents invested money into getting like a, a fax machine, a printer, and some other basic equipment. And they opened up a print shop literally a block away from campus. Now, Bolivians are cheap. Like, I don't want to stereotype, but I think probably Latinos in general tend to be a little more frugal. Um, and so even though it was just like a penny less, students would leave campus and walk to my parents' shop to get their copies and their faxes and all that fun stuff. Like, my parents saw that, they knew their market, like, they're not entrepreneurs, but they, they were, kind of. They knew their market, and they uh, established a little business, and they used that business to help them get their, their seed, their capital, for their next venture, which was coming to BYU, coming to America. 
And I love that story because uh, little, there was a lot of different examples in my life where like, the entrepreneurial spirit like, literally saved our lives or literally gave us the opportunity to uh, you know, further our, ourselves and further our happiness. Uh, I took those lessons, and as, as early as I think I was eight, my first business I started, uh, it was actually really embarrassing. I was trying to find a picture. I couldn't find one. Um, I, was a, <laughs> I was a party clown for hire, and so I asked my mom to take me to GI. I got like this like um, clown costume, and I put makeup on, and I would literally get paid $20 to go to a birthday party and make party balloon animals. So I learned how to make like little balloon animals. I was actually 10, not 8. Uh, and, I, you know, $20 like an hour for like a 10-year-old, it's pretty cool, right? And so I realized, okay, if I do my own thing and I can market myself and my skills, I can make money. That's, what, that's as simple as it started. Uh, and then this was my first like flyer. I went door to door. This is when I turned 12 and I was officially old enough to babysit. Um, I went door to door. Uh, now, mind you, I couldn't do half this stuff. Wash your car. Like I never, I still don't think I've actually washed my own car. Uh, or like cut grass. Learned how to do that this summer. Like I didn't know how to do any of these skills. But I went door to door and like solicited my services. This is when I turned 12. Um, I'm like, yeah, what, I, I wish I didn't write this out, but, uh, and lots of other things. I don't, I don't remember, like, how much business I got, but that was just kind of the hustle and, and you know, the, the immigrant spirit uh, passed on through my upbringing. Um, let's go on. So getting to my, like, career. So in college, or in high school, uh, I, I knew I was going to be more serious about starting a company, but I knew I wanted to get some experience. So I was like, well, I'll study economics. And uh, I went, I, I did one of those, I, I lived in North Carolina for a little bit uh, in high school because of my dad's job. But I, I, after, you know, after school, go to cheer practice, after cheer practice, go to the local university or the local college uh, campus and take some credits. And so that's how I was able to graduate so early because I get asked that all, a lot. Uh, and then I ended up coming back to go to school at UVU. And I knew I wanted to study economics or you know, to be in business. Long story short, and this is actually kind of a sad story, um, I got discouraged really early on uh, in my econ journey. Uh, and this is embarrassing to admit, but it's because I was the only girl in all my classes. And I just felt like so little um, and just like insignificant and sometimes like dumb if I asked a question in class. Um, so if any ladies are in here, I can't like really tell because the light is bright. But um, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that because I ended up not doing econ and I did a general business degree. Well, I did a double major in business and justice studies. Um, so I went to UVU. During UVU, I met a lot of great entrepreneurs. Um, I did my best to try to network at an early age because I knew I wanted to do my own thing and get some experience. And I met a man named Dave Elkington, who was the founder and CEO of a company called InsideSales.com. Now, this was when they had less than 50 employees. They were, we were in a tiny little office in South Provo. Um, Dave, I think, is a teacher here in the Tanner Building now. Maybe an adjunct. I'm not sure. But anyways, um, he's still, I think, the chairman of the board. But uh, I... I joined um, a little startup called InsideSales.com, and he took a chance on me. And so one thing I love doing is giving like underdogs a chance because he had no reason to hire me. I was just a scrappy 20-year-old punk who had no idea, like no real skills probably. But I knew like I was hungry and I knew I wanted to like build something. Uh, so he took a chance on me, spent five years at InsideSales.com, um, then got recruited out uh, to a company, a fintech company called Canopy when they were about 50 employees as well. We grew that. Uh, we tripled revenue the two years I was there. Um, I was there as a vice president of people and operations. And then I left Canopy to start uh, my own company called Chimney. I realize that's a very um, a long intro. <laughs> that's my journey. I guess I didn't mention Ford. Uh, in college, one of my things, one of the things I really wanted to do, and this, I hope this comes across the right way, but I wanted to, whatever job I had, it doesn't matter if I was making $8 an hour, $10 an hour, I wanted it to benefit my future plans. So I found this job, and it was in marketing, um, and I took it, and it was great. And frankly, like, when I first started my company, after I didn't pay myself for a while, after, when I started paying myself, I actually made more money in my college job than I did at my uh, being a CEO of a company, um, which is true for every single CEO you talk to. Um, all righty. <laughs> so I... Uh, Okay, let, 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 me, let me ask the groom, like what, just throw these out, and please don't be shy, but what attributes uh, come to mind when you think of like what makes a great entrepreneur? Like attributes, skills, values, whatever. Discipline. Yeah, discipline. Do you want to shout them out? Extroverted. Extroverted, okay. Scrappy. Scrappy. Creative. Creative. Organized. Organized. Persistent. Persistent, okay. Optimistic. Optimistic. Oh, I like that one. I didn't see that one. You can come in. 
You guys haven't even hit on like any of my. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> what? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Resilience. Okay. Good. Give me like five more. Cool. Okay. Focus. Enthusiastic. Fun. All right. Good. Um. So I just did this like fun little word cloud of just the ones that I brain dumped, like which ones come to mind. Uh, I highlighted a few that were more important to me, and when I say more important, every single one of these is important, obviously. And it's so interesting because if you had one of like my other uh, CEO buddies up here, they would have picked five different ones, but I or six, sorry, six. Uh, but I picked six specifically that were important to me when I got when I was starting out. So let me repeat that. When I'm thinking about, or when I was thinking about what I could share with you guys today, um, I didn't want to share a lesson of like how to keep scaling a company. I mean, you guys are like, we, we talk about zero to one. Have you guys heard that fr uh, phrase, zero to one, right? Like starting from nothing and all of a sudden like having something. That's like where most people fail and most people don't even get to the starting point because it's, it's hard. So I decided like I'm pretty close to like where you guys are going to be or where you are when you start your company. So I think the most valuable thing I can teach you is like what attributes I focus on when actually ju when just getting started. Um, so yes, all of these are important. I'm going to focus on six that really guided me on starting my uh, tech company, Streamly. Okay, so uh, yeah, so uh, courage, humility, determination, innovation, honesty, and gratitude. Um, I am a very visual learner, <laughs> and I really, really hope um, I can do these like pictures justice. Or I guess, yeah. Uh, I wanted, like I told you at the beginning, I wanted to just share a collection of some of my favorite stories with you um, and hopefully weave in some lessons. So to kick things off, we're going to start with courage. Uh, first story I want to tell you guys uh, is, so like, courage, <laughs> in my head I was going to be really smooth at this slide, but I keep laughing because that is so depressing. Um, so courage is a really interesting one. I, I know someone mentioned that. Uh, when we started Streamly, I remember my parents thinking I was crazy because they were like, you're a vice president, you make fantastic money, like you own a you know, small percentage of the company. Like they thought, they didn't, under, they didn't understand why I would leave something like that to go do this. And honestly, they still kind of don't. Well, when we signed our last term sheet, they finally did. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a process for them because for them it's been more like uh, binary, right? Like you have a job and you're like glory or you don't. Um, so, so the courage to actually quit an amazing company that I loved, the courage to convince or to get my co-founder to quit, she was, so she was at Lucid Software, and another amazing company, um, and the courage to leave these awesome buildings and offices and all these comfort and the money and the equity to start in my unfinished basement. Uh, I love this picture because it reminds me like where we came. And, and by the way, guys, we started this company 11, 12 months ago. Like I am early in my entrepreneurial journey. Um, so please don't think we have like 10 buildings like Podium. We don't, not yet. Um, so that's what's one story I want to tell. The second story uh, is uh, around, uh, <laughs> this is like a tweet I pulled. So uh, Todd Peterson, you guys know Todd. Uh, he's the founder, CEO of Vivint, um, Smart Home. He like owns a jazz now, I think. So I, I saw, we, we uh, decided to do a pitch competition, which hopefully all of you guys dabble in sometime in the next year or two, because they're really fun. We decided to do a pitch competition. This was like, our company was like two weeks old, no line of code, we barely had a name, and but we just went for it. So we were the earliest stage company. They did like a round of, I think like 60, and then a round of 32, and then a round of eight, uh, like March Madness style. We made it um, all the way to the finals, uh, to the top eight. But in the round of 32, I remember when we were all pitching, I, I see in the corner of my eye, like uh, I was like, I'm pretty sure that's Todd Peterson. So I'm like, the worst thing you can say to me is like, like, go. like. Not, not interested, like little entrepreneur, like peace, right? And I was like, the worst thing you can say to me is like, no. So I go up to him and I'm like, Todd, I'm in sales, you're in sales, like, you know, like trying to be like charming and probably came across really awkward. Um, but he listened, I, I had 15 seconds of his attention. At a very high level, I didn't pitch my company, I pitched myself. Um, and it was kind of a gut reaction because I know he's in sales and I know if we close a deal with Vivint, it would be a huge deal for a company that doesn't have any lines of code written. Um, but long story short, he ended up going on stage because he was so excited about what we did, took the microphone, addressed the people in the audience, um, and then pledged an investment. And I was not expecting that. And so he said, Andrea, stand up, said some nice things about me, um, pledged an investment, 
And I was like in shock. And the cool part is that like Ryan Smith, who's the founder and CEO of Qualtrics, who you know I've gotten to know um, over the last little bit, like retweeted it. So all of a sudden, they went from like just like dum dum in a basement with like a fake company. I'm just kidding, laughing. Um, to like people know who we are. Like we're actually making moves. And it all took. A, it was a moment of courage. I just wanted to go up to Todd and pitch myself. Third story um, is at Saster. So who's here? Who here is familiar with Saster? Okay. Who here wants to be in like tech, like B2B SaaS? Okay, raise your hand higher, because I think there's like, okay, okay, a good amount of you. If you have any desire to like start your own thing in tech, or you want to work at like a, a startup in tech, do yourself a favor and like read Saster. I promise you like that is one of the only ways I was able to move up so fast in my career, because everything I just learned from Saster, and like went into board meetings like, hey, I know what I'm talking about. Um, read Saster. So Saster is, a, is the biggest um, community for SaaS professionals, so software as a service, right? Um, I went to Saster Annual uh, two years ago as a vice president and uh, just to learn as much as I could for my company. I went back last year as a first time founder again. My company was one month old at the time. I saw Jason Lemkin. Jason Lemkin is the founder of Saster and he is one of Silicon Valley's darlings. If you want to get into entrepreneurship, you need to know who this guy is. He's awesome. He's everywhere. So I see this guy um, in the hall, another moment of courage where I'm like, all right, he's going to probably think I'm annoying or lame or just like a leech, like, you know, whatever. But worst thing he can say to me is no, right? So I walk up to this guy and I'm like, Jason, listen, buddy, uh, it's my second year. You know, I, I told him my story. Again, try to be charming. I don't know how it came across. Um, interestingly enough, he said, that's a really cool story. You should tell that. I'm like, yeah, joking. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come back next year, you know, do a breakout session. He's like, no, 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 tell it at the keynote in 10 minutes. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, and so we went backstage. He got me mic'd up, or the, the people got me mic'd up. And within 10 minutes, I was telling a Streamly story on a stage with 10,000 people. Um, that's crazy. That stuff doesn't happen. And honestly, if I didn't go talk to Jason, that would have never happened. Frankly, it's very rare that you get to be at a keynote on a keynote stage, right? Um, this story right here, we ended up making the top eight companies. We got to pitch in, on a stage at the Tech Summit last year in front of probably 5,000 people. Um, did anyone go to the Tech Summit this year? Yeah, a few of you. So you guys know how big it was, right? So all of these cool moments, like these cool moments, happen with, with a mo because of a moment of courage. And you guys all have those moments as well. And you have to remember that the worst thing someone can say to you is no. Once you remember that and once you actually accept that, you can do anything. It's kind of motivational, right? A little bit. Um, OK. Next one. This one I was like roasting myself a little bit about because like humility, I don't think you can see it. And there's just all these pictures of like me with my friends like smiling, you know, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't look like I'm like really humble. But let me explain. <laughs> um, so I think. People that are humble and people that have humility know that it's okay and know that they should ask for help. It's okay to ask for help, I should say. Uh, there's a lot of, mm, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this, there's a lot of ego, like when you have a really cool title. Um, I know there is because I'm friends with a lot of these people that do have egos. You guys can probably think of a lot of individuals that have these like monster egos like in our wonderful state. And so one thing I wanted to make sure I didn't do was get so caught up in like being so cool that I didn't ask for help, or I couldn't ask for help. Um, I may have gone like the opposite direction and I asked for too much help, so I probably should like chill on that. Um, and the reason I have a picture with all of these people is because one of the lessons I learned really early on is you've gotta find your tribe, you've gotta find your village. It takes a village to, to make this work. It doesn't matter how smart you are or how great your idea is or how much venture capital you have, you could be outsold uh, beat to market, there's a million different things that can happen. There's a million different ways your startup can fail. I'm just gonna say that. So you need your village. And so for me, that was finding other entrepreneurs at early stage companies. So these are some of my buddies um, that started other tech companies. Um, some of them are doing like a million plus in revenue. Some of them just started. Some of them are further than that. Um, these are some of my female founders who are amazing. And even though I feel like I'm probably the only female in B2B SaaS, um, these amazing, talented female founders are doing crazy things like starting e-commerce or B2C. Um, Susan from uh, Freshly Picked, her baby moccasins, I think the Kardashians wear them. Uh, Jenny Wecker from Fawn Design. I mean, my village of like female entrepreneurs, they're just so talented, it's ridiculous. And then lastly, this picture right here, um, odd enough, 
uh, our investors are, that led our last round, it's a firm in the Bay Area called Village Global. And like their whole thing is like, takes a village. So when we signed a term sheet with them, we were like, whoa, it's kind of cool. It's like one of, our, one, one of the things that is very important to us is asking for help and, and fi finding your tribe. And so this was from the retreat that we just had this past summer. Um, all the portfolio CEOs, they took us to like Napa Valley, middle of nowhere, five days, super zen. In true Bay Area fashion, there was probably like shrooms being done. I don't know if I can say that because we're on BYU campus. But like, I didn't partake. Um, but uh, it was so Silicon Valley that I'm like right there in the little corner. Um, but it was so cool. Like, I can call any one of these people at any given time and ask them for help. In fact, one of these guys right here, Dion, who I talk about in another slide, he won TechCrunch Disrupt last year, which is like huge. Uh, and he actually also invested in my company um, as an individual. So find your tribe. Oh, I'm pointing to this, are you guys? Sorry. Find your tribe. Um, it takes a village. Ask for help. Like, be humble enough to ask for help. Make sure we're good on time. Um, okay, <laughs> determination. Uh, someone mentioned that as well. And I was thinking, like, what pictures could I show on this one uh, that would adequately tell a story and or share a lesson? And this one is kind of a lame slide, I realize. But um, once upon a time, um, I'm just kidding. So uh, w the investors that I talked to you guys about in the last slide, um, they, when we were negotiating, you have to do the song and dance, right? You have to get people excited about what you're doing. You have to play a little hard to get. It's kind of like dating, like seriously. Like you have to, I hate saying you have to play games in dating, but you kind of have to um, be a little bit strategic. Yeah? Maybe that's why I'm still single. Um, but um, you, uh, so they were, invest, they were um, vetting out our company, seeing if we were like the right team and the right product to bet on. And on the phone, I was like, look, 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 Anne. Look, if, you, if we sign this deal, like, I, it's ridiculous. I have, like, an alter ego on, on the phone. I'm like, look, Ann, if we sign this deal, um, I would move to the Bay Area in a second. Like, you call my bluff if you want, but I'll move there in a second, right? I'm based in Lehigh, Utah, by the way. Um, fast forward two weeks later, she texts me, hey, we're good to go. You're going to get the term sheet in your email. Next text, when, can you be out here next week, like Winky Face? I was like, oh, well, I said what I said. Hopefully, I was hoping she wouldn't remember. So within four days' notice, I packed up uh, what I needed because I didn't know how long I was going to be there in my little RAV4, including my mountain bike, which is dumb because it's California. <laughs> I didn't ride it like once. Um, and I drove out to San Francisco. Now, if, has anyone ever been to San Francisco or lived, maybe lived in San Francisco? Lived? <gasps> what? I love it. Okay. So San Francisco kind of is the worst when it comes to housing. Um, it's so expensive. You guys, I paid, when I finally found a house, I paid $1,700 a month. Crazy, that's insane. Um, and on top of that, it's very competitive to find a house or find any kind of housing. Um, I'm telling you this now, because in case anyone wants to like go live at Entrepreneurial Dreams in San Francisco, plan better than I did and don't move out in four days notice. Um, long story short, I lived in my car for about a week. Um, and this is a, a dingy parking garage in Chinatown <laughs> um, where I like literally would like would live. and you know, go to my meetings like an entrepreneur, like I, need, I have a term sheet, you know, I'm, I'm building things, I'm going places, and little do they know that after I leave these fancy dinners, I'm going back to my car <laughs> to sleep. <laughs> it was really sad. Um, and, <laughs> and I will be honest, I almost put a picture, I took a selfie one time, you guys, oh, I'm so embarrassed, of like me, like, crying. <laughs> and I took that picture to remind myself of how hard this is. I'm serious, and I almost put it in here, but I didn't, it was too ugly. Um, and um, there were so many times in that week, one week, it wasn't even that long that I was homeless, that I wanted to go home and be like, you know what, extremely was fun, that was good, I'll go be a vice president again somewhere else. Uh, so many times, in fact, I look at those texts sometimes, like where I texted my friends, like, hey, I'm coming home, and I'm so glad I didn't. I was determined to make it work. I had to make it work, and I, luckily I had a village, a tribe to support me along the way. Um, Posted this picture of me smiling because this was my little house back here um, when I finally found a place to live in San Francisco. It was my little sanctuary. The funny part is, like, I felt very safe here because San Francisco is a crazy city. Um, but I lived with three dudes that were all like techno DJs. And so I was like trying to build my tech company downstairs in my room, and they were like blasting music and all kinds of like party drugs upstairs. And I was like, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, anyway, so I. This picture just reminds me to always be determined for the next thing. Even if it's a week of being homeless, 
The week is nothing now. It doesn't seem like anything. But in that moment, it was the worst thing ever. And I was determined to make it work, which we did. And this was my last day when I was leaving. First day in San Francisco, last day in San Francisco. And I was finally going home. Uh, let's keep going. Innovation. All righty. Uh, real quick question. Yes. How long were you in San Francisco? Um, I was there permanently for four months. And then I went um, I back and forth because I still had a place out there for about three more months. So I officially got rid of my place like two months ago. But I'll be back there in like two weeks. So, um, And yeah, if you guys have questions along the way, I know we have a QA, so maybe Q&A. So maybe like save them, but also I'm happy to answer them along the way. Um, all righty. Innovation. We are doing good. All right. More pictures here. <laughs> my team, um, this is so after... Someone said scrappy. Someone, and I can't remember who, yeah, scrappy, gritty, I like all those words are great, right? Um, we, to date, <laughs> maybe this stays in, amongst all of us here, but to date we haven't paid for office space. A lot of entrepreneurs have a similar story, so it's not like that I'm so great at negotiating. It's that you don't want, you want to keep costs low. And if people give you free office space, you take it. Um, and so the reason this picture, it's about innovation, I promise, but quick side story about scrappiness. Um, this, we were actually in uh, Peak Ventures, which is now Album Venture, P uh, Album VC. We were in their office for a while. A company called Neighbor, we kicked them out and we moved in. We, we didn't kick them out, they kicked them out. Joseph is a good friend, so we, we're, we're not beefing, I promise. Don't spread that. I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, so we were there, and I, I love taking pictures of my team when they're working because so many of our pictures were like smiling, like, we just won an award, or like, we just signed a deal, or whatever, right? But I like these kinds of pictures because this is like what reality looks like every day. Um, and innovation is so, so important. And, and remember what I told you, I wanted to focus on six specific like, attributes um, that helped me getting started in my entrepreneurship or entrepreneurial journey. Um, innovation is, is one of those six because again, I, I tell this to all of my friends that want to start a company, like ideas are stupid. Maybe that's like a harsh way to say it, but your idea will probably change. Actually, it will 100% change. And frankly, like, if you have an idea, that's great, but if you can't execute on it, it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, there are, like, no, how do I say this? Like, timing plays way more into any idea. You could have an amazing idea, but if you're too early, you're not going to make any company. Like, I'm not trying to squash your dreams, but it's true. Um, so, that being said, my first idea was pretty stupid. <laughs> Actually, I don't think it was stupid. I think it's, um, I think it's genius, and one day we will evolve to this. But we were naive to think that this would be our first home run, if that makes sense. So if you see right here, uh, the original idea for Streamly is, was like a approvals HQ. It was around getting the right information to the right people at the right times through the right channels. It was around connecting information and decision makers um, and, and just getting to decisions quicker, right? It's a good idea. I'm still convinced it's a good idea. Um, but in true like lean startup methodology, you need to find a beachhead. Like, sure, if you're building a generalist platform, like a Slack, who's, who's familiar with Slack? Most kid. Um, it works, but even Slack found their beachhead being a developer tool initially. They didn't start off as a generalist tool. They started off being a tool for developers to communicate. So I've known this lesson my whole life, but I had to learn it myself. I had to go and <laughs> build this extremely one, or like beta that we were literally in beta for like five months and I look at this, I'm like, this is so lame. Like, why did I do that? I wish I'd just listened to those books I read and started doing this earlier. But then I say, okay, Dre, listen, you had to learn this on your, on your own. You had to go through those hundreds of customer um, surveys that you did to learn about the real pain point. And so, yes, this generalist model served you to, uh, you, you were able to, I'm talking about a person, um, I was able to, um, test out about 25 different use cases on our generalist platform, and we collected the data and the stories and the uh, information we needed to really find our beachhead in real desk automation. So, these aren't two different ideas. This is just an innovation based off of this initial idea. Um, currently, this is, I just took a screenshot of this this morning, actually. Uh, this is our home landing page. Um, so we are deal desk automation. We are, a, a, like I said, a B2B SaaS play. Our whole platform exists to streamline, which is why we call it Streamly, to streamline um, your sales close process. We called it Streamly because we wanted to streamline everything. <laughs> we wanted to streamline approvals for everyone. So we didn't have to change our name, which is nice. 
Uh, but any great company you hear of um, will have a similar story. And I'm not, I'm not saying like, oh, we're so great. But I mean, like, they, they had to innovate. They had to change things up when something wasn't working or when they learned something new. Um, okay. I think this is our last. Oh, we have two more stories, and then we'll wrap up. So honesty is the next one I wanted to talk about. Oh, this one's painful. Um, <laughs> honesty is an obvious one. Um, you need, obviously, you want to be honest in your dealings with men. I think that's actually the temple recommend question. Did I just steal that from? I might have just stole that from something. But you want to be like honest in your dealings, right? And your contracts and your interviews, um, all that. Totally. Um, but you also need to be honest with yourself. And I say this because so many times as an entrepreneur, you will be, you'll honestly start lying to yourself a little bit by like how big you are, how, how like um, your, your trajectory, like you, there'll be so many reasons for you to lie to yourself as an entrepreneur because it's hard. And we do this as a, as from a point of like trying to save ourselves. Um, you have to be honest with the fact that it is hard. And so one thing I, I do uh, is like on my Instagram, I'm, I'm private, so like don't, don't look me up. But on my Instagram, um, I'm really open and honest about like times that it sucks. But I'm also honest about like all the fun things I get to do. And so I think it's important, and I think as entrepreneurs, as you guys go and build your own thing, keep like please do that. Because far too often we have like CEOs that stand on stages and smile, and it looks so glamorous, but you guys, I'm telling you, it's hard and it's not that glamorous. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's really, really hard. And I think it's important to talk about the hard stuff. Um, one of those, and I, don't, I know this, this warrants a whole other two hour lecture. Um, one of those is like around mental health. And that's been something that the entrepreneurship community, um, especially in tech, has had a bigger conversation around. We lost three CEOs in the last like year to suicide because of this. Um, two of them were my friends. So it's, it's hard and it's real and we have to be open and honest with ourselves and our community about what we're getting into. So yes, with honesty, be honest. When you slip in a term in that contract, that's really good for you guys. Be honest to that customer, but also be honest when you look in the mirror. So the story with this is we made it to the top eight in the Silicon, uh, Silicon Slopes tech competition. It was awesome. We were the earliest stage company, like these two women that started the software company, like we were like Silicon Slopes darlings. We were on cloud nine, it was awesome, right? And everyone was expecting us to win. And that was bad <laughs> because we started bleeding. We're like, of course we're gonna win. But you guys, we were competing against people that had actual dollars and actual platform. We didn't have any of that. Um, and we flat out lost. Now granted, we were top eight, which is cool and everything, but we lost. And I can tell you that that was, <laughs> it sounds so dramatic, but it, I remember it, I felt like that was like the worst day ever. Like, because I was humiliated in front of 7,000 of my closest friends and colleagues. I was humiliated because not only did we not win, but Josh James, who's the founder of Domo, like literally like ripped our company up. And we're like, oh man, this is really embarrassing. So we were like humiliated. And I had in invited investors to come listen to us pitch. And I had invited like potential hires. I'm like, guys, we got this, you know? It was the worst. And so when my co-founder and I went home, um, we're like, do do we want to go back for day two and show our faces? Uh, <laughs> we kind of didn't want to, but um, we had to look in the mirror and we had to be honest. We're like, you know what? We lost because we didn't present as good as the other teams did. We lost because we don't have revenue and we can't share really cool insights or we can't share a platform or a demo or anything. These are all the real reasons that we lost. We were honest with ourselves. We got our little badges back on the next day and we showed up. And guess what? The world didn't end. <laughs> It was great because we were honest with ourselves. If we weren't, we wouldn't have shown up. And who knows where we would have been now. And I realize that story sounds so dramatic, but in that moment, it was the worst. <laughs> All right, uh, last story um, with the six values or six attributes is gratitude. So I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, so three buckets I kind of want to highlight for my gratitude slide is one, my team. I am so thankful for this band of misfits. We're, we call ourselves like this like band of pirates. We have no business being in tech. I look nothing like a CEO, I know that. Um, all of these guys, uh, all these like, they are underdogs. Like we are truly like an underdog team. Um, and I'm so thankful that they're, and so grateful that they quit their jobs and joined me in this like little basement startup. Um, so anyways, that's our founding team. 
Uh, next category is, I want to highlight two of our investors. Dion was the guy I told you about who was like Silicon, Silicon Valley sweetheart who won TechCrunch this up last year. Uh, he actually just stayed, um, he's in San Francisco, he actually just came out and stayed at my house for a few days. Um, and then Mike Leventhal, if you want to start something, find a way to get to know Mike Leventhal. Uh, your traditional big wig Silicon Valley investor who ended up retiring in Park City. Um, guy has a picture of him and Taylor Swift like hugging in his house. Like this, it's like a $20 million home in Park City. This guy is awesome. Um, find people like this and do whatever you can to try to get to know them. <laughs> because I promise you, like my heart is so grateful for these two. They have moved mountains for us. They have introduced us to people that I would never have thought I could meet, um, like Taylor Swift. I'm just kidding. I've never met Taylor Swift. And actually, I really don't care about that. But, um, but uh, they will open doors for you, and, and you need to make sure that you always have this grateful heart for these individuals. This was actually taken at a BYU football game. He had never been. And of course, like since he, inv he, he invests in like every good deal. He's in Podium. He's in Qualtrics. He's in Pluralsight. Uh, we're like the early stage deal he's done. But he like called up Brian Smith and he's like, hey, can I come to the game? And so he had like, he was on the lawn, like this guy can do everything. Uh, and then the last bucket um, is, and I'm a religious person, I was gonna say like, I don't know if you guys are religious, but if you're at BYU, I'm, I'm gonna assume maybe, um, is for me, I've always felt like there was something that has guided me along the way. Um, now I've, like many of you probably, maybe, I've um, had doubts and I've had moments where I'm like, church is true, everything is perfect, like, you, you know, um, as we'll continue to have, but I know for a fact that there's something outside of just these people, and just like my brain, has helped me get to where I'm at, and I never want to forget it, and never want to be ungrateful for my Savior, so, um, those are the six attributes, oopsies, sorry guys, um, but we have a bonus one, <laughs> um, is don't lose yourself along the way. And I couldn't think of an attribute that would sum that up, but I was like, this is probably the one thing I tell every entrepreneur when they're starting their business, is like, who you are, that's what's gonna get you there. Don't, don't change that. And so I, I wanted to include a few pictures of what I mean, and this is super embarrassing that I posted this, I realized this, but the reason I did this is because like, I have this mentor, she is amazing. She is one of the very first um, partners uh, in Silicon Valley for a big VC fund. Um, she had to pave the way for the next generation, which includes like women like me and you guys, right? Um, she would have to go to work in like a brown suit. And she, because if she didn't, if she wore something like this or like this, like they wouldn't take her seriously, right? We live in a world now where you can stay who you are. You can be yourself. I show up to board meetings in a hot pink dress or like my J's or whatever, right? Like be who you are unapologetically. That is your, ma that is like your magic power. Um, Keep your hobbies, keep your friends. I know like everything I'm showing you looks like I'm basic, but that's okay because in a board meeting, I can control the board meeting and with my friends, I can have fun and just be myself. Heck, I could go home and just watch The Bachelor and like eat Taco Bell like, and then you know, next day sign an enterprise deal. Like, it's great, you can have both. You don't have to have one or the other. Um, my mom hates this picture because she was trying to, I just won an award like last week for the emerging leader thing and she was like, smile, hijita, which means daughter. She was like, smile, hijita, and I was like, okay, hey. you know, and she didn't like that. And so I framed it and I gave it to her. Um, but, uh, but, but, uh, you know, like, yeah, like lean into those stereotypes, guys. That's your magic power. Like crazy dog lady, I don't even care, right? Like I box with my dad all the time. Like I get to beat my dad up, which is awesome. It feels so good. I am one of like a million grandkids and we all match on Christmas. Um, I'm like the oldest grandchild, but I still match with like the babies, right? Uh, proud to be Bolivian, I'm never gonna hide that. I, I'm a proud Latina and that's, that's something that's really important to me. So be who you are and don't ever change that and be unapologetic about it. Okay, and we are doing so good on time. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, like I mentioned, be mindful of what attributes make up your character, right? And then be or stay values driven. Um, one of the things we did at Streamly before we had a product or I don't, maybe we didn't even have a name yet. I think we did. My co-founder and I, we had just, um, like, we knew what we were doing. We just didn't know what the company was called. <laughs> and we didn't really, um, like, I think we just barely quit our job. So we were still, like, in the oh crap moment. We were like, before we even start anything, let's um, establish a set of values, which is kind of backwards to how companies do it nowadays. 
they'll usually think about values and culture as they grow and as they scale, which makes sense, right? It's something that's like an organizational part of a startup. But we wanted to do it before we even wrote a line of code because that's kind of like, I don't know if this, if this will work, but like that's kind of like our Leahona. I'm flipping like a, a term there. But that's like our, like our map, our compass. There you go. I was like, what is the, what is the word? Um, that's our compass, right? Whenever we need to make a decision on something big or decide on you know, who to partner with, we look back at our values. So when we first uploaded our website, um, which was really, really, really ugly, it's the only page we had was our values because we wanted the world to know what we believed in. Um, and yes, they will adapt a little bit because as our company grows and as we introduce new team members, um, we're definitely going to want to include their set of values into our overall value set. But as an individual and as a, I guess as a two-person founding team, we wanted to make sure that the values that she and I held very, very dearly and that really believed in were baked into our company day one. Um, and I always like to end every presentation, which I realize this is totally like off topic, but um, I always like to end everything with book recommendations. Um, so take a picture of a slide or like or write them down or whatever, but these are some of the books that like I live by. I have all of these books, so if we're friends, you can borrow them from whenever you want. Um, they're so good. We could like, ugh, they're so good. Uh, I recommend for sure if you want to start with one, if you're raising capital, I don't know if anyone here is raising money, Venture deals, you have to read it before you go pitch. Um, Crucial Conversations, regardless of what you want to do, is probably the best, uh, most influential book in my career. So that's a good one as well. Um, so I love ending with book recommendations so you guys have a little bit of like, you know, uh, direction. And I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much for letting me come and chat with you guys. Uh, please email me if you have any questions. I would love to hear from you. You can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, thank you so much. Yeah.